Welcome to Trial Site News Podcast Series. Today we have a guest, Alan Cannell, who, full disclosure, has been a collaborator with Trial Site News down in Brazil. An engineer by training, he is originally from the Isle of Man between Scotland and Ireland and moved to Brazil in the 1970s and now has a family there. He has been applying his methodical engineering mindset to studying the trends of using ivermectin, at least at the local level in Brazil. So, Alan, welcome. Yeah, welcome to everyone as well. Yeah, nice to be here. Well, we're glad to have you here. And we brought you on to talk with us about COVID-19 and ivermectin. And so to give our audience a little background about you, can you share with us some of your interesting background, where you grew up, your profession, and how you ultimately ended up in Brazil? Yeah, sure. I, I was born in the Isle of Man, and uh, we emigrated to what, what was then the, the mainland, which was the United Kingdom, moved around a lot, went to several, uh, at least a dozen schools, and ended up at university, did a master's in uh, transport engineering in Leeds. One of my colleagues there was from Brazil. I've always had an interest in the country ever since I was about 14 or 15. Don't know why, but there it was. And uh, it was the boom period. And uh, he said, oh, okay, come over. We'll get you a job in a question of days. And that was actually the case. So I moved to Rio in uh, 72 and then moved down to uh, the south of Brazil, Curitiba, which is a cooler town because it's higher up uh, in 74. And it was like being in the right place at the right time. And if you're lucky enough, you can turn into the right man. You know? So there were, there were a lot of things happening in the, uh, in the engineering, the urban engineering sector. And uh, I ended up staying and making a career and uh, you know, family and everything else, becoming a citizen. And so that's pretty much my background. So let's shift it over then to COVID-19. Can you share with us how you first got interested in how uh, you first got interested as a citizen, uh, COVID-19 researcher. We know that you were following some of Dr. Lucy Kerr's work in Brazil. Could you expand on that? Yeah, we actually got caught in, uh, uh, in Paris because I have a younger, our younger daughter lives in, uh, lives in Paris and uh, wow. is now a French citizen. And we got caught in the lockdown. It was uh, very strange because on, on the Friday, all the bars and the restaurants were all full. And on Monday, you couldn't leave the flat you know, the, the apartment. And eventually we managed to get back into, uh, back to Brazil. It was chaos. All the flights were canceled. Uh, fortunately, I, I got a car from my son in Sao Paulo and we drove down. And then we started looking around and saying, well, you know, how can we try and better the odds uh, against this, uh, against the, 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 the virus? No? We're both in the, in the, uh, uh, a risk age group. Uh, my wife's over 60, I'm over 70. So, uh, well, I thought the first thing to do is to, um, it's a coronavirus. And so we know that uh, zinc is uh, 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 useful to uh, minimizing the effects of coronaviruses, especially the common cold. I've tried it on myself, I know it works. So that's the first thing to do is to up the zinc content. Uh, immune response, well, we know that the immune response is related to vitamin D, so let's take a vitamin D supplement as well. And uh, then start checking out to see what else is available. And that's when I came across the, the, the studies by, by Lucy Kerr that, that uh, she was uh, promoting on, on the videos in, in Brazil. And that set me off looking at uh, some other places. I'd worked in Africa before. And people were saying in, in April or March and April that when this uh, COVID hit Africa, it would be a disaster. But for some reasons, or it, it wasn't that bad, maybe because of the age uh, distribution, there's more young people. Uh, but there are countries that I've worked in, Af in East Africa, I've worked in Mozambique, and uh, I'm aware of the fact that that uh, they have lots of problems with um, all sorts of nasty parasites. Uh, one of them is river blindness and most of East Africa was being treated with uh, ivermectin uh, for prevention of river blindness. And I noticed that the countries that had this sort of policy of like every six months treating everybody were having very low reported uh, COVID-related uh, uh, deaths or COVID-related cases. 
Uh, and that caught my eye. And so adding the, the stuff from Lucy Kerr to you know, the data that I was seeing from Africa, I thought, well, this is probably worth, worth taking. Now, I, ivermectin in Europe uh, is considered to be something that you give to, to animals. Yeah, it's, it's more a veterinary sort of, a sort of product. So when you have contact with people, we have friends in Italy, we have friends in the UK, they, they all get surprised. They say, well, you know, we're not buying this because you give it to horses and stuff like that. You see that um, here in the States uh, as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just don't give it to collie dogs for some poor reason. The, the poor dog, they, they don't like it. But in Brazil, it isn't. It's the sort of thing because we have lots of our own nasty parasites, a tropical country, and people are, are used to to the idea of being treated for uh, uh, preventive treatment for parasites. So like every six months, you know, you've got small kids, every six months or every year or so, they, they take a dose of whatever. And uh, all my kids had, you know, had, the same, had the same thing because they're crawling around in the dirt and you know, they stick things in their mouth, you know, they're playing with a dog and, and uh, this leads to, you know, sorts of worms and stuff like that. And so it's used uh, widely used here as a anti-parasite uh, medicine, and you could buy it, you know, over the counter, uh, very cheap because it, it was one of the essential medicines that aren't really covered by patent. Uh, so it's like a dollar a, a packet or something like that. Uh, so that we adopted the protocol of Lucy Care, and with no side effects at all, and. Uh, then I started following uh, the, what was happening in the rest of the world because I couldn't understand why this wasn't being um, given a wider audience or why this, you know, the, 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 there was such, uh, there was a lack of news about this. It just didn't come on the media. All the talk has always been about vaccine, it's vaccine, 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 and very little, you know, even about zinc and vitamin D that, that should have been, uh, prescribed or given directly to people in the medical profession, uh, especially. Uh, nothing about this at all. So um, I found the trial site news and, and uh, I said, well, you know, when it's being used in several towns here in Brazil. And that got me interested in, in checking out the, the uh, actual data, what the, the data was, was uh, from some of these towns, what the data was saying. And it's very positive. And that was the, the data I sent off to Daniel that, uh, and that was a short, um, uh, a short essay, if you like, a short column on, on, the, on what happened in these three, three towns in, uh, in Brazil. Yes. Now, can you share what you shared with us in terms of the way local health authorities can prescribe or offer this type of care in some states while in others not? Yeah, it was a very strange thing because uh, when uh, certain cities, because the, the, the Supreme Court said that uh, the handling of how this, the, 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 the measures uh, against the, the, the virus should be handled were, would be left to the states and to the municipalities. So we have a, a federal system, a bit like the states, if you like. So on a county level, on a state level, there were options of whether you had lockdown, whether you had semi-lockdown, whether you had uh, schools open, schools closed, you know, where the public transport was running, when it wasn't running. So the, it was very fluid in terms of response. But what we could say is that most of the country went into a sort of like a semi-lockdown, which was... Um, most of the public transport was, was shut. Most of the schools were shut. Uh, restaurants, uh, cinemas, all those sort of things were shut. Uh, you weren't supposed to do travel too much and uh, uh, you're supposed to stay at home as, <clears throat> as far as possible. Uh, most places you had to use a face mark if you were uh, face mask if you uh, left uh, the house or whatever. Uh, and about 60% of the people actually a bit obeyed it. A lot of people could not obey it because they, they have sort of like a hand-to-mouth existence and they just had to keep on working. If you don't work, you don't eat. The government, federal government came out with, with a income support 
measures. So, you know, people that uh, lost their jobs or could no longer work because they were self-employed. We have millions of people that are self-employed. Uh, they got, uh, you know, a couple of hundred bucks a month to, you know, purchase essentials and food and, and stuff like that, uh, which worked uh, to, I think, to defuse social tensions. So the, the, you know, the things, people didn't get that desperate that, that looting broke out, for instance. So it was actually quite, a, a quite an, an efficient response. Uh, some of the towns, they said, oh, well, we, we'll check out the ivermectin and uh, we'll uh, use this as our own municipal protocol. So what happened is that these three towns, Itajai, uh, Natal and uh, Makapa, eventually uh, started to distribute ivermectin. The word got out. People started buying it you know, by themselves. The government responded by saying, oh, we, you can't buy that anymore unless you've got a prescription. Uh, so the, the off-label, over-the-counter sales, in theory, were, 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 were stopped, came to an end. That only lasted a few, literally a few days, because a lot of the health authorities, state and municipal, complained. They say, oh, well, you know, okay, we'll give a, a prescription for this, but... You know, people have to sign it saying that they are aware this is a, an off an off label treatment, but we want to continue with this. Um, this that, that was the case. You know, so the, several of these towns uh, carried on using the the, the protocol, uh, but again, nobody actually made uh, gave out the results. You know, so the results, although they were very positive, uh, they became just sort of had no media attention at all. Now, uh, now we did some research showcasing some real world outcomes and based on the data, it would appear those localities offering the ivermectin combination treatment overall appeared to have lower COVID-19 case rates. Could you verify this and perhaps shine some light on this? Yeah, that, that was the case. The, um, in fact, there's, there's some more interesting cases actually came up because the, the number of like COVID related deaths in, in the towns that, that, we, uh, that we published on the site, uh, they're all down below uh, one, one death per day in, uh, for October. I just checked this morning. Oh, wow. Um, most of, of uh, the cities and states now have uh, reduced death rates, which is uh, positive. The, um, the health system has not been overstretched. No, no one has got to the stage where, which is uh, something that should not happen to any health professional, professional, that they have to decide. They have to decide who gets to live and who gets to die. You know, this is, right. That's the, the worst case scenario, and that, that wasn't reached. But in the towns that, the, that they adopted this protocol, and other towns nearby, because a lot of people just sort of picked up on this and, and they adopted it themselves. Uh, and one other town up in the Northeast, which is a, a, in, a, in a state, small state, a million and a half, two million, called uh, Sergipi. So the town up there, Aracaju, uh, people started adopting the same protocol. And it went from a very serious situation in the end of uh, July. It just dropped right off. And the, uh, the, again, the, the number of cases and number of deaths has gone dramatically down. Uh, we know that, that people are buying it by themselves because the, the price of ivermectin on the, on the street price, if you like, uh, just went up. And people started complaining to the actual consumer, uh, consumer board that... Uh, the pharmacy companies or pharmacy shops were were overpricing their stocks, so there was a, a demand, even though it was not a part of the, the local municipal protocol. But what is interesting is that uh, the state justice department ordered one of the towns to distribute ivermectin. They, they based on the constitution, they said no. Now, we can't risk um, the number of beds being occupied, the, you know, the rate of beds being occupied going over 100%. So it's now 90 whatever percent. And so uh, anything that's available that will reduce that you know, has to be distributed. 
So this was the state department ordering the municipal, uh, one of the bigger towns in the state to actually uh, distribute this. And it wasn't challenged. Nobody would, took it to the Supreme Court. So it's the sort of thing that uh, became part of, of um, overall uh, response to, to the virus in Brazil. The second thing is that uh, the federal university in this state, Sergipe, uh, has approved, has federal approving for funding for a trial on uh, the use of avamectin. It's a nano distribution of avamectin to COVID, uh, COVID um, patients. Hmm. So I don't know how it's done, if it's in, uh, intravenously or probably nasal spray. But it's another one of these things, and it wasn't included in, in that uh, Australian paper that uh, noted there were 70 uh, clinical trials in, uh, underway. And this is one of the clinical trials that was, was overlooked, but it's, it's quite a big one up in the, the northeast of Brazil. And, uh, so we're waiting to see what you know, the, the results they get there. Right. So based on what you know, how many regions or cities are allowing its use currently? Allowing is, is pretty much everywhere now. Uh, actually promoting, there's, um, there's probably over a dozen. Yeah. The, the reaction, the pushback at the beginning uh, that came from, let's say, the, the public attorneys and, and uh, other, other sort of media and everything else, that actually has dropped. No, nobody's raising and you don't see any questions raised it's just a question oh, yeah, it seems to work all right go ahead you know nobody's going to stick their neck out and say you can't do that anymore uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why the the situation has improved a lot in uh, in uh, in brazil in the in the past oh, month or so although uh, we're all waiting now for the you know the, the so-called second wave or covid 20 or whatever they're going to call it and um the data coming out shows that antibodies are good for a few months, but not, not necessarily for a few years. So it looks like we're going to have to live with this for, uh, for many years. And uh, people will talk about COVID-21 and COVID-31 or COVID-23 as being a, a nasty year, a bad year or whatever. Uh, and this requires not just vaccines, because the vaccines might have to change every, like flu, flu shots. You, know, the, the, you can't wait for new vaccines to come out to treat a new variant of this this sort of uh, this sort of virus. Right. So the world actually needs uh, a protocol which will reduce the mortality and reduce the rate of infection and reduce the the, the number of victims, and also ease the, the stress on the medical profession. Um, so uh, the, it's very, very important that we have good data and follow up of, uh, of all these, these factors, like, you know, like vitamin D, like zinc and like ivermectin. Now you touched on vaccines, so I want to jump into that. Brazil has been very active in inking vaccine deals with various pharmaceutical companies. What are you hearing about the progress of these trials in Brazil? We should note that a volunteer died in the AstraZeneca study, but the word in the press is that the individual was on the placebo arm, so they kept the study going. Any comments or thoughts on vaccines in your country? Uh, well, first thing, of course, is that vaccines are needed. If you're going to eliminate something or other, you have to have a vaccine. Brazil is very strong with, with uh, the use of vaccines. Um, they tend to be... a uh, Obligatory, you know, um, whatever that is in English. The um, uh, for uh, for certainly for child, uh, so things like measles and um, uh, and several other sort of childhood diseases, which would, when I was a kid, you were supposed to get. Uh, now here, they're they're treated because genetically, for instance, uh, the populations at higher risk from. Uh, things like chickenpox and scarlet fever and measles. Uh, measles especially because it's a big killer for anyone with um, a Native American background. Right. Uh, so uh, we have uh, trials now for several vaccines. Uh, the Astra 
Uh, so tech is is one of them. Another one is uh, uh, Chinese one, Sinos on the other. Uh, there's about three or four of them. Um, our state uh, has an agreement to produce here in in uh, in our town the Russian version. Hmm. So these are going up to stage three trials, and and uh, we hope that this this works uh, fine, and that the reactions will be that there won't be too many adverse reactions. Uh, um, I think one of the problems is that everyone wants to be the first. Everyone wants to be wants to be Saint George. You know the the, the story of Saint George and the dragon, and so that there's a lot of um, there's a big desire to be to have the prestige to be the, the Saint George figure that turns up on the white horse with the big syringe and and kills the Chinese dragon. Yeah, it's a good uh, way to get yourself memorialized. Yeah, so I think that the the um, you see a lot of a bit of political infighting between the the the, the, the current president and who who favors one thing and a state which favors another. And so the, there, there has been some political use of this, which has been very much frowned down upon, you know, the, the press is, uh, is, and, and the medical establishment. And they have come out very strongly that uh, they're interested in finding something that works you know, rather than uh, uh, giving people the, the prestige and the votes for being, you know, for, for assuming the, the knight in shining armor figure. Yeah. Right. Now, so we you you touched on the state and local levels where there seems to be an accept acceptance and availability of ivermectin. What about the national level? Um, are they are they embracing this as well, or are they still refusing uh, this cheap and and available drug as a potential option? Uh, nobody's interested. It's cheap and available, and so if if you want the prestige and you want the big money then you're looking for something else rather than the cheap and available. No? Uh, the media isn't really interested because eventually they're going to have big uh, vaccination campaigns. Uh, there'll be a lot of um, uh, public money being, being pumped into the, uh, the press, you know, for the spots on TV, for, you know, for everything. Uh, you get a lot of um, negative sort of stuff in the press, you know, guys saying, wow, you know, the, first of all, it was hydrochlor hydroxychloroquine or uh, hydroxychloroquine, I don't know how you pronounce it in English, that was the magic drug and that was a silver bullet and there's another one comes along which is a silver bullet and then, then ivermectin is another silver bullet. Uh, they published studies showing that, that uh, several drugs don't work but they leave it, you know, ivermectin is left out. So there's, I think it, it's a, a case of follow the money. And uh, so that the lack of interest is, is exactly, as you said, it's cheap and available. So who's interested? There's no Which is patient. a shame because it, it's definitely like, I would have expected a much wider um, spread of information on it here in, uh, in the States, but that has not been the case. That's probably why the, I, I think I have to insist on this, is that the, the importance of, of trial site news in keeping the data and the results in the public eye, uh, especially when we, we start talking about COVID-21, COVID-23, COVID-31, uh, when all these possibilities are, are on the horizon, we need something as well as just the vaccines as pretty much as backup. And uh, so we have to know if this works. You know, we have to know how much it works. Uh, we have to know if it's worthwhile. Uh, how do you combine it with other stuff you know, to, to make, you know, to potentialize the, the effects, the positive effects. It's a bit like, I worked for many years in, in road safety. And so it's a bit like knowing that when well, you have to have seat belts, the seat belts with airbags are even better. And seat belts with airbags and an internal structure that absorbs energy is even better still. You know? 
and the glass, if it doesn't shatter, is even better still. So it's a question of, of having all these, these, these backups so that you can be prepared, you know, because you're not going to avoid a collision. Collisions are going to happen. People are going to smash into each other. They're going to smash into lampposts. Drunks are going to smash into you. So you have to have these backups and know which work and how they work best in combination. And this is the sort of information that we have to get ready so that we don't have to wait another six months in three years for a new vaccine and a new bunch of candidates to be St. George. Yeah. The syringe will be the same, okay, <laughs> but disposable. Yeah. Well, and you want to have more than one arrow in your quiver. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. If you, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if you, want, if you want to kill a dragon and your lance breaks, then you really are in shit, you know. So you you need <laughs> you need some arrows in your quiver as well. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, based <laughs> on your many years of experience as a professional researcher and observer, an observer of life, would you say that economics plays a part in what drugs get reviewed seriously? We, we touched on the cheap drugs and the lack of interest. So I'd like your thoughts on this. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's two things here that, that are worth mentioning. The, the first one is that the, the reaction of the medical profession has been a bit strange. Uh, medical profession, they, they, they have their own way of doing things. And if you don't do it their way, it, 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 there are two ways of doing it, their way and the wrong way. That's the only way of looking at it. Um, I can understand all that, you know, try, uh, double blind and all the, the correct protocols and this, that and the other. But when, when you're working in public health and road accidents are a huge problem of public health, you know, traffic accidents, you can't take the medical approach. You have to take uh, a, a different engineering point of view. You know, look at the numbers and find what works. So let's say child seats. I worked for you know, to bring child seats into into use in in Brazil, and you can't use a medical protocol which say, okay, I'm going to get 500 mums, and I'll give half of them a real child seat, and the other half I'm going to give a fake one. And then we're going to check out when they all smash into something, what happened to the kids? Ah, oh, you know, the ones with the, you know, the real child seat, you know, they survived. You, know? you can't do that. Right. This is one of the problems of, of the medical profession that, that I found in, in road safety is that they, they will take huge care and uh, statistical uh, information on victims. So once they're inside the hospital, then you've got really good data about what sort of trauma, what sort of uh, consequences of accidents, but they do not look at the causes. You know, so that no one's very interested in, ah, well, what happens with, if you put in um, uh, mitigation measures to reduce the number of collisions, if you, if you, do more electronic enforcement to lower speeds if you do more roadside checks to weed out the the drunks now the the, the doctor the medical profession as a whole doesn't look at that they just ignore it right and so we're looking at something rather similar um and then in the case of uh, to, to answer your question the case of the money i think the um, you know follow the money is always a good rule and uh, when you look at the values that are being asked for by the, the uh, World Health Organization, you know, by Brazilian government, uh, by the, the owners of the patents and everything else, you know, there's just this huge amount of cash. Now, God knows where it's going to come from because there's no, <laughs> nobody's working. But uh, whatever, you know, there's just billions and billions being the words are being it's like Carl Sagan billions and billions you know when he was talking about stars so the um, the interest is obviously in the cash and that's certainly um, affecting I think the 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 way that the solutions are being sought for but again it's typically you can't really prove it but the only thing we can say is that other situations other forms of uh, mitigation 
uh, are, are not getting the attention perhaps they should deserve. And before we let you go today, do you have any final thoughts for the trial site news audience? Uh, for the audience in general, uh, anyone who's interested in the in in the COVID response uh, uh, has to keep this up. Now, these things, kind of, the media cycle is very very short, and it's getting shorter every day. Uh, attention spans are, are getting shorter every day. You know, if uh, God help us, you know, in, in a in a <laughs> in a world when when people have a, a when presidents have an attention span of 30 seconds and uh, it, it's getting down from from a one page summary to a 140 character tweet is the attention span. Yeah. So we can't let this go because we're going to know we're going to need this information. We're going to need the results. We're going to need the uh, the data. It has to be you know out there published uh, and, and aware people have to be aware of this. If and when we get troubles with the, you know, the COVID-23 and the COVID-31 and all the other versions that might very probably roll in in the coming years. And uh, we just can't let what happened in this year happen again. Uh, people, people will be called to account. And uh, we can't let what has happened. I've seen this in Brazil before. Um, something something went very wrong. This was the Zika outbreak uh, and it was covered up. So we can't uh, ignore the fact that uh, the mitigation measures you know, were not given the attention that they, they deserve and that we have to have these measures in place uh, next time round. We can't expose medical staff to viral overloads and let them suffer the consequences. Now we have doctors in the family and uh, medical profession uh, professionals in the family, and it's just uh, unacceptable to uh, for, for these people to be exposed to this sort of level. Yeah. And so, you know, the, my message to to everyone is to keep it up wise words and uh, we thank you for joining us today so uh alan canal it's been a it's been a pleasure and uh stay safe over there